So my, the idea of, of uh, my talk was to follow up with uh, Jeroen's talk and Giovanni's talk on the nematodes that are associated uh, or can be found on the surface of other uh, marine organisms. And what I was going to focus on, on actually uh, on the association between nematodes and different groups of invertebrates and see uh, what we know about these different types of associations. So uh, it's um, not surprising that uh, many large sedentary invertebrates have a very diverse nematode fauna and uh, normally this, these are the same nematode species that are found in the let's uh, call it uh, dead on the dead substrate like we can expect similar nematode fauna in coralline sand and in corals or in shell gravel and in oyster beds or in sponges and different types of epigrowth. Uh, very few nematode species that were uh, actually disclaimed to be strictly associated with this type of um, environment maybe some parasitic ones like uh, Halomon hystera cameroni that was actually uh, is a parasite of oysters but normally what we find here is we cannot make any link between the host organism and the nematode itself while the situation gets a little bit uh, different when we start to look at uh, actively moving organisms uh, let's see how I how I do this okay uh, there were some uh, work done on the uh, deep sea gastropods that live on the sunken wood and it turns out that some of them have a uh, quite peculiar nematode species living on them uh, very of often found in uh, in the operculum and in the aperture of this nematode of this uh, gastropod uh, we looked at many different individuals and we only found one species the same species very common it seems like they are going in and out of the aperture and uh, stick around the operculum what they do what here how they feed uh, what's the what's their uh, purpose here we don't know uh, the problem uh, in this case is that we don't really have uh, samples from the sunken wood itself. So we don't know if the same nematodes will be found on the wood and they're just sitting hanging around here of this mollusk uh, for whatever reasons. Uh, in another case also a uh, gastropod from the sunken wood here, there is there are a few more species you can see uh, the uh, this muscolix here and these are some linhomoids uh, I think if I remember correctly there were three or four different genera this is also a slimy substance that's been accumulating in the operculum of the mollusk so this here is an aperture and uh, here is uh, the operculum again we don't have a sample from the sunken wood itself and we don't know if presence of these nematodes here gives them any type of benefits. Assuming that this slime is produced by the mollusk, so there is a, a high protein content, maybe a bacteria growing there, and uh, they serve as a food for the nematodes, but there is no way we can establish any clear association uh, between these two organisms. So now when Moving further to, uh, uh, let's say, actively moving organisms and uh, mayofauna. I want to uh, st first speak about things that we are clearly know that are uh, definitely parasites and then uh, focus on the nematodes that we found out that have a certain association with uh, invertebrates, but we don't know what type of association it is. But I want to start with this, with this statement uh, from uh, Walter Zuthaus, who is a nematologist working with uh, terrestrial nematodes. And what he is writing here 
is the impression that non-marine nematologists have when they look at, uh, at the literature data, when they want to see, uh, learn more about a different type of uh, association between nematodes and other animals, whether it's parasitic or mutualistic. And so as you can see, the statement is that it seemed like most of the marine organisms are free of parasitic nematodes. How true it is? That's the question that I want to first start. And yes, there are uh, nematodes that are parasites in other marine invertebrates. There are three different groups that are well, relatively well known and there is no question about them being the parasites. The first group is the Bentimermetids. Uh, not very common, but not very rare. They parasitize, they can be found in all sorts of marine invertebrates, including the nematodes here. So this is a sample from the discovery collections from the deep sea, and you can see the one Bentimetrophomera species inside uh, here nematode called up. And there is another one that stretches all the way from the tail end and going somewhere here. So there are about what 40 different species in this group, not too many, not very abundant. Moving next, even less common group, Marimermetids, also found in a, uh, unfrequently in a deep sea, again associated with different uh, types of hosts, not much known about them. The third group is a very peculiar genus Echinomermella. There are only two species found. They're mostly found, uh, one species was found in Echinus esculentus, the other one in Strongyloton trotus in Europe. And this is a, a sample from a, in the petri dish. You can see uh, probably 10, 12, 15 females. They can reach up to one meter in length. And these tiny, tiny little threads here, these are bits and pieces from the males that are much, much smaller and very fragile. So in this case, this is, um, seemed to be quite common in Norway, in the Northern Norway, in Strongylogen trotus, but it was probably, it's, for me, it's the hardest species to get hold on. So the sample that I have is about 70 years old. Uh, we try to sequence it and nothing works. So anything else that can be called a parasite? Um, it's here, this is when things are getting a little bit more complicated. And there is a variety of nematode species that are associated with different types of crustaceans, including uh, semi-aquatic uh, and even land crabs. I was going to show you here the habitat where they live in. Most commonly they are found on, in gill chambers on the gills. But uh, when samples were fixed, I transported them and over time, uh, the gills, the, sh the movement of the sample, the gills got cleaned up and the nematodes fell out of the gills. So I'm just showing you the actual specimen that was dissected uh, where nematodes were collected from. And some of the species, they live, uh, they uh, live in these kind of uh, sediment conglomerates that are uh, between uh, leaves in the gills in uh, these clumps of, uh, of sediment that are stuck between the gills in, uh, in the gill chambers. <sighs> what they do there, we think they are feeding on the bacteria in, or the assumption is that they feed on the bacteria of, uh, that, that live in this uh, mucus glued uh, sediment. We don't know if they are uh, having any impact on the uh, livelihood of the host. But then there are others that live in the same habitat and can even be found in the uh, body cavity in the crabs that look more like this. This is the anterior end and uh, this, 
structure of the stoma doesn't really look like it's a typical bacterial feeding nematode. Whether it's feeding on the tissues of the crab, this is something that uh, I would <coughs> probably like to know a little bit more about. So here I just show you the two genera. There are several others. In, there are several chromadurids that uh, live in uh, associated with uh, crustaceans. There are some monhistorids. There are a few others. They, some of them uh, live also in the uh, between the eggs that like uh, between the eggs that uh, the, uh, are being carried by the crustacean on their legs. Uh, some I know there are big uh, predatory pontonima nematodes that live between the eggs uh, of uh, large lobsters and there they feed actually on the symbiotic polyhedes. Uh, there was an experiment done in Sweden by one of our colleagues. So there can be multiple uh, reasons why these nematodes are uh, occupying the body of the crustaceans, whether they live, whether they are feeding on the other symbionts or whether they are feeding on the, maybe they are feeding on the host or whether they are feeding on the bacteria that grow in these clumps that they create themselves. Um, Recently uh, described by me, recently found in Sweden, another parasite from the group that up till now never had, never uh, had any uh, obvious parasite, parasitic nematodes, uh, found in a shell gravel. Here you can see a small specimen inside the polyheat. Here you can have a, see a bigger specimen. And in this picture, you have uh, an SEM picture of the polyheat, and you can see the head sticking out of, uh, from the body wall. And this uh, wider part of the body, this is where actually the nematode is uh, inside and stretching out the body wall. The trick with this nematode is uh, that it parasitizes only as a juvenile and uh, adults are free living. Well, just like in Bente Mermitids and Mar Mari Mermitids, but uh, the male that I was able to find, it's really hard to, by looking at it, it's really hard to say that it it's was uh, parasitizing inside the other organism uh, for larger parts of its life because it doesn't show any obvious adaptation to parasitic lifestyle. The females, uh, despite sampling for five years in the same locality, I haven't been able to find it yet. I don't know, maybe it's too different looking from these specimens, maybe it's short-lived, maybe it's seasonal. <clears throat> I'm sure if anybody else uh, saw the female of, of this nematode, I probably considered it as a free living and didn't even connect it to the fact that the juveniles are parasitic. So this is something, this is where we are having a problem identifying the uh, type of lifestyle that nematode has and its association, uh, possible association with other organisms. And there will be few more examples of this type of uh, issue. So within the same group, there, were so, there are several, uh, species, one officially described several published in the popular publications of nematodes that are parasites of uh, different uh, larger size for a minifera found in the deep sea. This is an example. Here you can see the female and the male and the female uh, is quite different from uh, closely related genera in the fact that it has a trophosome-like uh, intestine where the uh, nutrients are accumulated and the digestive system is reduced. But the male, on the other hand, and these two were found inside the same foraminiferum, the male is no different from the free-living closely related genes. And here comes the specimens that I collected myself. These nematodes were originally described 
has been freely been found in the sediment where the feeding habitat been unknown. And this is where I would need a help of the audience. I will show you a few more pictures and I would like to think, you know, your opinion about uh, what these nematodes are sitting inside. There are some, my assumption was that this is some type of unicellular eukaryote. There are structures sometimes visible inside this, uh, this uh, how, would you, how would I say, uh, enclosure. Here, a few more examples. So here you can see some morphology here. The uh, outer layer is also has a texture that you can see under the very high magnification microscope. And all these species, this is a Camacolymus, this is on hume. You can see here, you can see a male, you can see several females, you can see juveniles. In the previous picture, you see here is a female and developing eggs, again, female developing eggs. Here's another example where it's a typical, when I opened this specimen, the morphology of the nematodes inside were typical Camacolymus, but you can see there are eggs here, there are a bunch of juveniles, there are a few females. What are they living in? This is a question that I cannot answer now and I would like your help when we have this discussion. But uh, taking regular samples, finding them, tons of people described Camacolymus and Onhium in their samples, and there was never ever a question of them being associated with any type of uh, marine invertebrates. Um, and the last series of pictures that I want to show you is again, uh, a group of nematodes that's quite uh, poorly known uh, that are associated with polyhedes. They actually live on the outside surface, not the inside, contrary to previous examples that I show you. And how many uh, nematodes can be seen in this slide? Eight. They all are attaching to different parts of the uh, parapodia or gills. There are uh, two different, originally they were described from Antarctica in 1960s, uh, one, of these, uh, one of these groups of nematodes. And I will show you here a few more examples. This is at a lower magnification. You can see a tiny, tiny specimen here attached to a parapodia. And then at the high magnification, you can see clearly see a female nematode with two huge eggs, again, with a head stuck inside the parapodium of, of a polyheat worm. Here, how they look on the, the microscope. This is the same exact female specimen. This is male and this is anterior end. If found in a, in a regular sample, they look, they don't show any, any clues to, the, to the, uh, their actual livelihood, at least not in my opinion. This similar stoma morphology can be seen in other nematodes with, a, uh, with a large hooks that are pointing outwards. But in this case, these hooks are actually used uh, to attach the nematode to the cuticle, uh, to the outer surface of their host. So, and the next example, even if is even more peculiar, they're even more common in the same samples. They were found on the same exact polyheat species specimens as uh, the Harpaconhide. Here you have one individual, another one. Here's another one, and there's, you can see another one. When I first found them, I couldn't even figure out what they are related to. Now I have a little bit uh, better idea. These are some desmodorate uh, nematodes, and the closest relative that we know is uh, uh, found in, typically found in, in a sediment with no known association uh, to any 
any invertebrates. It has exactly the same stoma morphology. It's the genus Pseudonchus. So, uh, was it, is it really free living or uh, do we find it uh, in the sediment because of the mechanical disturbance that happens when we process the samples and it gets separated from the host? We don't know. How to um, improve the situation? This is what uh, the few problems that I think we can tackle if you want to know more about this type of association. And the first issue is that when people collect the material, the macrofauna that came in the same sample shouldn't be thrown away or shouldn't be given to the other colleagues, but actually should be preserved in case someone wants to examine it and see and test for any uh, macrofauna nematode association in them. And maybe our uh, sample treatment methods of fixations are not as good and uh, for example, if uh, marine sediment is treated with a fresh water to detach the nemato uh, nematodes uh, from sand particles, maybe that causes also uh, epibiotic uh, ectocommensals to detach themselves from their host, or uh, maybe it causes the cells of or bodies of the host break from the uh, rapid changes of osmotic pressure and the, the symbiont gets released into the sample and we cannot make a link between it and its host. And the last one I think, uh, which I would really be uh, glad is if any one of you sees any weird, strange nematodes sitting on or inside other marine invertebrates to get in touch with me. Uh, it should be on the very last slide here. You can contact me by email. You can uh, contact me via Twitter. I have a Twitter feed on Nematode Systematics. You can follow me there or you can contact me through ResearchGate. I will be very happy to look at your specimens and see uh, what they are. And here's for example, there are already some people who've been sending me specimens, my colleagues in France and Canada, in, in UK. Some of these uh, specimens were used in the screen and some of them were not. Uh, and well, just a standard acknowledgement to the funding agency that funded my research and the marine station that was, uh, that I've been using as a basis for all this collecting for past nine years, trying to find that elusive female of Neocomacolimus parasiticus. So I uh, would like to thank you now and we can continue with the questions. <laughs>